You'll have noticed, I didn't notice last week until after the sermon, when it appeared on YouTube, that it had been 32 minutes long. Perhaps evidence of how uh, unfiltered I was as I was writing it that week. It's a little longer than usual. This week, uh, it was thrown together much more swiftly because this was what I wrote uh, immediately after last night. So we're reflecting today on what happened yesterday at Vision Day, and you might want to do that by listening to me, but Brenda is waving at me because the other thing you might want to do is draw. You might want to reflect on what this church looks like by doing something. We've got acetates. They become stained glass windows if you put them up on your windows at home. If there is a vision in your heart of what church is, because you're however old you are, if you would like to do some of that, then Brenda's going to set you up. You probably want to be at a table, but you could kneel at a chair. There's a thing for you to do for you to express what your vision of church might be, whatever age you are. Go and find Brenda. Much easier on the table. Plenty of room at that back one. If you would like to do that, please follow Brenda over there and she'll get you started. And you don't have to, that's fine. It's not a kid's activity. Adam, do you want to? My drawing is very amateur. It's at least as good as mine, my friend. So, I... good man. So we, um, I, I also need to footnote this. I stole the first half of today's sermon from Bishop Chris. It's what he was telling us about Acts. And I stole the second half of this sermon from everybody who was here yesterday and what we prayerfully decided. It was our vision day. We met for a whole day. And we thought and prayed through where we're going as a church, what we might be called to prioritise, what our values are. But before we did that, we looked at that reading that Sally read to us from Acts 2. That description of the early church, that just after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit had landed. 3,000 people had been added to the church, people of all ages, and they suddenly had to work out what on earth were they going to do. They didn't have Brenda and her acetates, but we do learn something about how those people came together as church. If we can see the reading up on the screen, it's there already. The first thing... And I think the most important thing that we learned from Bishop Chris, have we discombobulated people who were sat at tables? Come and find somewhere to sit. I'm sorry that we've dislocated you. The first thing that we learned from Bishop Chris is that they devoted themselves to one another. That devotion is at the heart of a healthy, growing church and has been right since the very beginning. That devotion... It's something we talk about in marriage, that you commit to being with someone through thick and thin, in good times and bad. Bishop Chris talked about being devoted to Bradford City Football Club, through thick and thin. And as his son said, why does there have to be so much thin? (laughs) I'm not a football fan. I come from a long line of Aston Villa fans. It kind of knocks the stuffing out of you. But devotion is a thing of commitment. We're told in this reading that church, you can dip in and out of church. We don't mind. If you just want to come for the coffee and the chit-chat, that's fine. But it works better for you and for all of us if you are committed to it, if you love it, and if you stick with it through thick and through thin. We read there that they were devoted to the breaking of bread, which for them was communion, but I don't think it just means to having communion. They were devoted to finding a way of doing worship together that filled and empowered them and that was new, that was not just about their personal preferences, that was taking stuff that some of them had known for years as faithful Jews and some of them had never heard of as Gentiles and creating a new thing that empowered them and filled them up. That's what they were devoted to in the breaking of bread. They were devoted to the teaching of the apostles. Puts a lot of pressure on those of us who dare to stand in front of you and tell you anything about what God might be thinking or saying to us. We learned when we looked at James, few of you should want to be teachers. But it doesn't just mean this. They devoted themselves to teaching because it's not about information. Learning stuff about God is is part of it, but sermons, podcasts, small groups, conversations with each other, being devoted to 
teaching, to scripture, to thinking and learning about God is about transformation, about being uplifted and moved on and inspired as you get to know God, not just learn about him. They were devoted to fellowship, to being with each other. And that's not just to chit-chat, to having pleasant times with each other. They were devoted in a costly way by going to the gym with people that they didn't necessarily want to go to the gym with, by welcoming people with the wrong number of teeth, say, that we heard from, from Naomi. They were devoted to fellowship, which sometimes comes at cost to themselves. Actually, I have to say, we're really good at that here. We'll talk more about hospitality. We are really good at being devoted to each other and helping each other through tough times. I always look at at Claire and Kim. When I was stuck with COVID, devotion from these people looked like lasagna, and that mattered. Actually, it's really easy for us, I think, for most of us to say, here, can I help you? Maybe being devoted to each other means more often saying, this is hard, can you help? But they were devoted to each other in true, deep, costly fellowship, in working this out with each other. They were devoted to prayer, Us working out where we're going for the next 5, 10, 20 years does not look the same as the strategy meeting at the Conservative Club or the Cricket Club or the Rotary Club. Their strategy and vision day is, what are your ideas? We'll write it down, we'll make a plan. It's not what ours looks like because we're a church. We need to be devoted to prayer. Bishop Chris was saying yesterday, I like this, he said, actually, if you took the Holy Spirit out of the book of Acts, 90% of the stuff would disappear. They were fueled by that. They depended on the Holy Spirit. They were living moment to moment in prayer. If you took the Holy Spirit out of most churches in this country, 90% of things could carry on. I'm not sure that's true here, but there's an element to the fact that we just crack on with our rotors and our jobs and doing our things. We need to be careful not to. Prayer is a thing that is always worth making front and centre. Uh, my challenge to you is to keep me honest on that. Before the nine o'clock service, we used to meet in the vestry, me and whoever was leading, or or Jonathan, we'd go and meet in the vicar's vestry and pray before the church, because it's important to start in prayer. This morning we met uh, at quarter to nine over there. Anybody who was doing coffee or welcome or tech or whatever, we met at quarter to nine and we prayed for the service. If you would like to pray for the service with us, we will be there at quarter to nine praying before the morning services. And I'll try and remember to do it before the 11 o'clock, but I'm nearly always having coffee and a chat with people. But we should be praying with each other. They did, and we do, and it's important that let's not lose that. At that time, we're told in the book of Acts, there were signs and wonders. Miraculous things were occurring through the power of the Holy Spirit. Things were happening that could only be explained by God, and that made the people around them go... Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's exciting. Oh, I want to know what's going on there. And people gathered and came and saw. And I would love for that to be the case here. I think it is. People look at us and have questions and are inspired by us. Signs and wonders. It means a lot of different things, but that's at the heart of church and it always has been. We're told that they had all things in common which speaks to generosity. They met each other's needs, whatever they were. The needs of all those people at that time were met and they were met by each other. They gave selflessly so that they could do what they needed to do. And they didn't do this perfectly. You'll read the stories in the rest of Acts. It didn't always work. At times people got guilty or cheated and lied and things like that, but they fixed it. There were times when they couldn't work out how to get their leaders to feed everybody. They had to stop and go, this isn't working. Let's change the way we do stuff. They were open to learning new ways of doing church. These are all lessons from the book of Acts about church. That's where we started yesterday. And we wanted to take that and say, what might that look like for us here? And before we did that, before we got into, oh, can we do this? Oh, can we do that? We stopped and we looked at things that we cherish, things that people already love. To some extent, this was a gathering together of the homework I gave you last week. There's going to be more homework. Where, but I asked you, what do we cherish about this church? What's already good? What do we cherish? A lot. A very lot. <gasps> All that stuff's on the board. If you want to come and see afterwards, we wrote it down. And I don't have time to unpack all of that now. Otherwise, we'll go past half an hour of sermon again. But there is so much that is good here. People straight up saying, oh, the people who lead our kids' work. Oh, messy church. Each other. 
Each other could be nearly all of those things. People cherish the support that they get practically, the support they get in prayer, the welcome they get when they walk in the room. The thing that people most cherish about this church would still be true if we knocked the building down tomorrow. That would scarcely affect what we cherish here, although we do. It is beautiful and we're thankful for it. This is a brilliant church and it is so because of you and isn't it lovely to know that that's what people cherish most? That we cherish that risking experimental thing. People go, oh, we'll do a vision day and people come, yes. Oh, we'll turn, turn, turn the chairs around. Oh, we'll try a battle. People like that we take risks and do things. People love the music. Lots of people are like, oh, I love the organ and it is great. And people, oh, I love the band. I love the way we sing with each other. The breadth and variety of music here. We love that. It is brilliant. There is something for everyone at the right time, I think. The beautiful buildings, the people who lead and volunteer and faithfully serve. Apparently, if you reduce my and many other people's lengthy sermons down, there are occasionally snippets of wisdom, Sally says. But isn't it good that there is stuff that people go away with having, that has helped them think better, live better, that they know stuff that is making a difference. And people consistently go out of Sunday worship uplifted, energised, ready to take on the week, filled with the spirit, going in the right direction. This church does that at the moment. Sunday worship is good. And we could do another half an hour. That is really good, isn't it? So we, fit, we did that. We did that. I thought, actually, that's really good. We look like the ACT Church. Vision sorted. What's next, Naomi? It is, it is brilliant, this church. We didn't come to Vision Day going, crikey, we're in a mess here. We came to Vision Day going, brilliant. But what is next? Can we do, not better, but can we do better for the next season? Where are we going as a church? We went round and we said, what do we all want from this? And we said, we want to know where we're going. What's the direction of this church for the next five years? And you'll see at the end whether or not we got there. What we were asked to do by Bishop Chris, the, the, the tasks he charged us with on tables were to think, what, are, what is our purpose? What's the point of us? What are our values? What's the way we're going to go about achieving that purpose? And then from all of that, what are our priorities? Let's have a look at that. What's our purpose? These were the common threads that we pulled out. We're trying to get, at some point, to some pithy statement that tells us where we're going. And I don't know what that will be. I was at a church once, had a really good one. They said their, their purpose was sharing life, loving leads. Told you everything you need to know. It was really specific. And when that church was making decisions about what they were going to do next, they could say, well, is it this? If it's not these two things, Somebody else can do it, great, good on you, but that's what we're about. Some kind of pithy statement that helps us know that's for us in this season. And I don't know what our purpose is, but it will include these words. There is something about us needing to, to be Jesus' hands and feet, somehow sharing our lives to go out to the community that we're so well connected with, to do that together. People talk so much about how good it is here the breadth of who serves, that devolved responsibility, that we're all in it together, and that we go out to the rest of the community, and it's brilliant that we're linked with them, and in fact that we go beyond them. Right from the very first commission to God's people when he was talking to Abraham, till this day today, the message has always been that you are blessed to be a blessing, and actually in giving it away, that's where the good stuff happens. All of these things need to come together into some kind of pithy statement that solidifies right for us in this season. That's what's next. I don't know what that statement will be. It's part of your homework and we'll come to that later. That's our purpose. Then we were asked to think about our values. Having looked at the early church, having cherished what this is, and then we spent some time looking at our homework. I'm going to leave these around for you. If you remember last week, I asked, these, I asked people to write Dear Hermione letters. And we created this vision of what the church might be like five years from now. These have all been anonymised. We've cut the names off the bottom. When I'm done, I'm going to leave these out. Come and read them. There's lots here. But that church, the vision that we see in the hearts and minds of everybody here, and everybody yesterday, and everyone on PCC, the values that we saw there are here. 
This place is, at its best, welcoming and hospitable and inclusive. We look out, we want people to come in, and those things are important to us, and we're pretty good at that. Maybe that's a thing we need to dig into do and do better. Hospitality is also a, it's an eating thing. You know, we start a new initiative here. It's the first thing that I've actually done that's new. It's take food to people, and that fits. When we get together for an organ fundraiser and there's food, when we turn up with chips from the pub yesterday and there's food, people in this congregation, more so than many others, go, oh, I do love to eat with each other. Something about breaking bread with each other, eating with each other, hospitality in here, in homes, is one of our values. And that came out really strongly yesterday. Nurturing is important here. We really want this to be, it seems, a place where you can safely be vulnerable and grow that everybody can be nurtured, especially because the, oh, the pandemic has been hard. People need nurturing. I could do 10 minutes on every one of those, but these are key values, and we'll need to narrow down which ones are at the heart of this community. Certainly, we're generous. Certainly, we are prayerful. We need to rediscover some of that, but this is a prayerful people. People talked a lot about us being open to new ways of doing church, of being humble, not saying, I know how this should be done, but saying, I believe that we know. Who else knows what? These values will shape what we do in the next season, and we probably need to pick the ones that resonate most. That joy, that's, that's the thing, that's the value at the heart of everything for me at the moment. There's something quite delightful, as much as it was chaotic, to see a bunch of people waving their right arm, left arm, left foot, right foot, jumping up and down. And for that, what we did about Father Abraham to be an expression of church, let there be joy in it. We moved on from our values to then say, right, Chris's phrase was uh, YBH, yes but how? Okay, if those things are important, what's next? We could do 20 things next, but we can't do 20 things next. We have got to work out what are the important things for us to focus on first. If we start thinking about those five-year journeys, if you read these homeworks and think, that's the kind of church I want to be five years from now, some of those activities will have started four and a half years from now. But some of them need to have started before Easter. How do we work out what our priorities are? And we just shared what things are on our hearts. And the first thing was young people between 10 and 20. We do really well with Sunday school. The team of volunteers, mostly you know, under Rachel, under Brenda, do astonishingly well. Our kids are well served here. And it is a pleasure that Toby's had to turn me up a bit because it's a little bit loud. And that, I love that. And we don't do as well, if we're honest, with people who are between 10 and 20, and we need to think about how we do that. And I don't know what that means. That's a yes, but how thing. Let's do better. And I think along with that is connecting with families. Carvey has changed. If you talk to people who've been in this church 50 years, 60 years, and some of them have, 50, 60, 30, 40 years ago, Carvey wasn't necessarily a place of, of young families. It was a place of slightly older, well-settled people. But there's a lot of young families here now because we've got good schools and we've got good churches and people move here. Are we doing as well as we could at welcoming young families? And we can ask them. There's some here. And we do well, but we need to focus on that. Some of these go through, through everything. Small groups are there. Small groups are going to be ways that we can address so many of these things. Small groups are a way that we can devote ourselves to each other, to teaching, to fellowship, to prayer, to supporting each other. How are we going to shape that? Because actually that's one of the things people cherished. When we said, what do you cherish? No one said, our small groups. That would be ridiculous because it's hypothetical. People cherished my small group. I cherish those people who stand in the midst of it with me, week in, week out. They are devoted to me, and it makes a difference, whatever shape that is. We need to think about, about that. Our Sunday worship works really well at the moment. People leave filled with the Spirit. Does it work perfectly at the moment? No, there are issues with that, and we will need to focus on how we shape that. And I don't think that's a four-and-a-half-year project. Some people can't come because they're at football, because we do everything on Sunday mornings, or they're at ballet or they're at, you know or they just don't want to get up again because it's hard and they do it all week some people don't want to get up quite as early because they're old and it's slippy out in the winter and we miss them and they can't come it's tricky 
I don't know what we're going to do about Sunday worship. And if you are passionate about the shape of Sunday worship, then there is a place for you helping us think through what that looks like, what our words look like, what our liturgy and our songs look like. It's all on the table. Yes, it's good. Yes, it could be better. These are going to be our priorities. And it can't be all of them. Listening is going to be a thing. As we, say, we keep hearing about how people are lonely in Carverley. We keep hearing about people who have had a tough time in the pandemic in Carverley, how people have been isolated. It's not just a Carverley thing, is it? But again and again, listening, being supportive, being a place where people know they can come and be seen and valued and heard and held, that's one of our priorities. I don't know yet which of these things we're going to do first, but I'm excited. I'm excited. It's a peculiar end. I like the sermons where we unpack a bunch of stuff, we ponder it, and then at the end I say, therefore, this. And this is not that. Nor was yesterday, if I'm honest. Nonetheless, I'm excited. We read the gospel. You heard the gospel. Simon stood in front of Jesus and realised what was going on. Like He stood in the presence of Jesus, and he didn't have a plan. He had the urge to fall to his knees in fear when you step into the presence of God. And yet Jesus said to him, come with me. It's going to be okay. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Isaiah, in the reading that we could have had this morning, was suddenly in front of God in a vision. And he was terrified and said, I'm not worthy. I'm a man of unclean lips. And God touched his lips and said, it's going to be okay. I will send you. Every single time an angel appears to God's people, he turns up and his first words are not, hello, you're right. What does the angel say when he at first appears? Do not be afraid. Every single time an angel appears, he says to God's people, do not be afraid. So as we step into the presence of God at the beginning of this season, I say this to you, that we are in God's presence. Do not be afraid. I came to yesterday saying, I want to, I want to map. I want to know the direction we are going. I want to know where we are going. Actually, I finished it at peace with the fact that what I know is how we are going. We pinned it down, but we're going in a way that is generous, that is all of us together. I know a bit about why we are going. It's because we love all the people around us in the community. I know the how and the why, and I know the who. I know that I've got, if not a clear map, that we've got a great team of map makers, that we are going to work out together where we are going. It might be a little destabilising at the moment, but there is a cause for excitement and hope and optimism in this season. I'm going to give you a homework now. This is going to come out to small groups as well, but I want you to start thinking about this, and we're not going to spend much more time on it. But our homework is going to be as follows. We want our purpose statement to be something that comes from all of us. It's got to be specific, concise, goal-oriented and clear. It's got to say something. Like that sharing life, loving leads thing, we can do better than that. It's got to be for us. This was Bishop Chris's. He said, as a church, we exist to share God's love in words and actions with the people of Carverley. He said it's got to be something you remember at gunpoint and that you could explain to a 10-year-old. I don't know which 10-year-old is holding us at gunpoint asking us what our vision is. But that's true. Now, I think we can do better than this. It's a great one, but this is your challenge. I'm going to send you away with this. This will come out on the the news email thing and come out to small groups. Here's your challenge. Can we write a different thing, similar to that, that takes those purpose words and forges them together? And it's probably not a thing that we do now, because it's all a bit chaotic and loud and we've been going on long enough. But if you've got thoughts, if there's something that pops into your head that coalesces that, that brings it together, please, I invite you to be part of that journey with me and with the PCC as we try and share what is our purpose for the coming season. I humbly stand before you and say, I don't know, but also that I don't mind that I don't know, that I am excited, and I hope you are too. Amen.